What is up? What is going on? Dave at SVA Baseball Card Collectors. And I will be driving to my job site today. So, you're going to get an extended version of my podcast. Yeah. So, um, in my Facebook group, there have been a bunch of questions from guys saying... I just, I'm starting back collecting. I don't even know where to start. So, since I have this extra time, I am going to basically go through it. Now, some people might go, I already know this, Dave. I'm so far ahead of you. I'm so smart and knowledgeable about the baseball cards, which is fine. So, go screw. But I just wanted to take this chance to give a long format and I probably what's going to happen is eventually I'm going to do little YouTube videos on each section and um, you know want to break it down a little bit a so I can create more content but also um, so I can go a little bit more in depth and things now starting off you make the decision that you're going to start collecting baseball cards again after your family, your wife, your kids all laugh at you and make fun of you and point at you, you then move on to what are you going to do? So you just go to your store, you get a Beckett or Tough Stuff, and you go, hey, nobody uses this crap anymore, and nobody does. If you go to a card show, the hacks over there will try to say, hey, the, pe- the Beckett value of this card is X, Y, Z. Nobody cares about that anymore. Maybe they have good articles. I don't know. I have no idea why they still create these price guides because really what it's come down to is the marketplace. And the marketplace is really eBay. eBay is where everything is at. Now you could buy cards and trade cards and other avenues, but eBay is the lifeblood of baseball cards. Where most of the pricing, you know, sales happen and how prices are somewhat, you know, agreed upon, you know, when you go into other avenues and you're trying to buy and sell cards. So the first thing, which will be a little out of, you know, you don't go, all right, so I'm going to go to my local store and buy some cards. The first thing you need to do is buy penny sleeves, top loaders, card savers, in a big cardboard box to put your crap in. Because just like when I started, I started to buy cards, I had nothing to put them in. So they just look nice on my desk, they look nice on the ground, they look nice in the box that I had, they look nice in the packs that I should put them right back in, Um, because I didn't have anything. You can go on eBay now, and actually, if you do go to a card show, you get better pricing with this stuff as well um and do realize that now when you go to buy a box now we're going to segue a little bit now when you're starting to go back into collecting the big thing now is graded cards um looking at a card and seeing that it's mint and everyone agreeing yeah this is a mint card is no longer you know valid no one goes by that. It may go well, it may look good, and a mint looking card may sell for a higher price, but really it's all about graded cards. Now, if you start to buy some graded cards and you're interested in that, you will need a different box. You will need a taller box, a wider box. If you're just collecting, you know, if you need a place for all your commons, which you will then you just get your regular standard box. Um, Also, you may want to keep all your cards in top loaders. And if that's the case, make sure that the box that you get is wide enough to have top loaders. A lot of complaints that people have is they'll get it and one row fits of top loaders. Maybe the two outside ones fit, but the ones in the middle don't. So they just where they put their commons you know, the cards that they don't put in top loaders. So just read the description. Very important when you go on eBay or on Amazon. um, I don't know what the best rates are because I haven't bought in a little bit because I typically buy it at my card shop. But um, 
just be wary of that. Read the description and understand what the hell you get. Read the reviews. A lot of people will put reviews and they'll go, this thing don't fit nothing. I can't put this, I can't put that in. And that's what you got to be careful of. Also, it's not like back in our day. You had one thickness of a card and that was it. And then they threw a Louie at you when you started getting the flare cards. Where that was thicker. And you go, what the hell is this? Uh, you know, it's pretty tight in my top loader. But it still worked. There's cards that are thick because they have jerseys in them. They have bats on them now. They have patches and cleats and whatever the case may be. Now, they are, they do have thicker um, top loaders. When I mean top loaders, it's exactly what it is. A top loader is you put the card in the top of it and it's a hard plastic case. There's other ones called card savers. And those card savers are the ones that um, they basically have a slit on them and there's like a little, uh, it has a top to it thin top to it and it literally says card saver you need these if you're going to want if you're going to submit cards to get graded to PSA to Beckett they go into card savers as with everything put everything into a penny sleeve do not just throw a card into a top loader do not just throw a card in a card saver there are some people that do that I do not believe that put in a penny seat uh, put it in a penny sleeve and then put it into the top loader or a card saver. You type in card saver on eBay, you'll see what I'm talking about because my description is horrific. So, you got those two things. When you're putting cards in a penny sleeve also, um, I did a video on it. It's a minute long. You can head over SVA Baseball Card Collectors on YouTube and you're going to want to, with your two fingers, you're going to want to... Um, the problem is you don't want to nick a corner. So you'll be able to put the first side in, no problem. But when you put the second side in, the penny sleeve is very, very thin. And you might nick the corner. And there, the edge of that corner may flip up. And you ruin the card. So you, with your two fingers, you try to separate the card sleeve, the penny sleeve, to make it bigger so you can insert the card. Go to YouTube, you'll see what I'm talking about. And um, it's a minute long, it's not long at all. <laughs> and you go, oh, okay, that makes sense. So, you do that, you have all your stuff. Now people laughing at you even more because you have all these supplies and now you have no cards. So now they're just going, ha ha, he just got supplies, you don't have nothing to put him, he doesn't have anything to put him in. Ha ha, or her, him or her got to be uh, gender, more gender neutral in these things. So, what do you want to collect? A lot of people will go, well, I want to collect what I collected when I was a kid. Now, if that's the late 80s through the 90s, mid 90s and early 90s, good thing for you. It will be very cheap for you to buy these cards because they're worthless. <laughs> that is the junk era. And when we say junk era, it's because they mass produced them. Millions of cards were being made of each guy, and they're not really hard to find. You could buy boxes of them real cheap. You could buy a whole wax box of certain cards for 10 bucks, 5 bucks. Um, where the value comes is grading. So in those 80s cards, they were produced a lot and now we're going to go into middle to early 80s they were still produced a ton but the production value in these cards are no so good they're not very good so if you get a card graded and they had them graded back in our day they had PSA um, they just it just wasn't as prevalent now that's all it's about so you now have two guys PSA and you have Beckett, and for vintage cards, now we're going to say pre-1980s, you have SGC. They're the big guys as well. And also in vintage, PSA is the, they're the like main guy, and SGC is the secondary guy in vintage. Beckett does do vintage, but people really don't um, 
give it as high value as PSA or SGC. So the modern cards, the newer cards, that's Beckett's wheelhouse and PSA and Beckett are rivaling back and forth on what's worth more. <clears throat> um, let me get into grading just a little bit so you understand. So it's graded, goes from one to 10. 10 being the best, gem mint 10. Most, in the 80s, it is pretty difficult to get a gem mint 10 card. If you go to buy a box on eBay and you go, I'm going to open up a box and I'm going to try and get a card and I'll get a PSA 10 because these cards haven't been opened and I'm going to make bank pro, it's not going to happen. I would say for most cards that have a decent amount of value in the 80s, you're talking about less than 10% of all graded cards get a PSA 10. I like to set this as an example. But you have the Mark McGuire 1985 Topps rookie card. He has 44,404 cards um, graded. Out of that, less than 1% is graded as a PSA 10, making the card really valued, about six, seven hundred dollars. Um, that is really difficult. So if you go to buy a box of 1985 tops, thinking that you're gonna pull Mark McGuire cards and they're gonna be Gem Mint 10, and you're gonna get them graded, you get them graded, and you're gonna make money, it's very difficult. Um, it's fun to do, and there are people who break these cards, and we'll get into what breaking is. That's basically you, you know, somebody buys a box and you buy a pack out of that box, or you buy a couple of packs out of that box. Um, but to do that and do that regularly, if you're looking for investments, that's not the way to go. Um, we'll discuss investments and stuff, you know, another day. So you have PSA one through 10, you wanna stick to eight, nine, 10. I would say more nine and 10, depending on the card. I only collect, I pretty much only collect 10s. If I can't afford it, then I don't go and, and buy the 10. Um, I feel those, they're the scarcity because of the overpopulation of the card um, makes it worthwhile for me to invest. So you have that. Beckett, on the other hand, you're talking about more modern cards. So you're now talking about the 2000s on where Beckett, that's their wheelhouse. And typically, you're grading the autographs. Now, back in our day, to get an autograph on a card was, I've never, I never had that happen to me. I don't know anyone who ever opened up a pack and was able to get an autograph. But now, they are very prevalent. And because of that, the grading you know, people now grade these cards and they become really valuable. Now, Beckett, um, when you get, there's two ways to go about it. If you have a non-auto card and it's just like their base card, um, Beckett can grade it and just like uh, PSA would grade it and it would go from one to 10. But they also have subgrades that you can do. Now, what are subgrades? They grade the corners, the edges, the surface, and the centering. So, when you get a card, and we'll do an autograph card, and let's just say we'll go with Mike Trout, he's the most popular guy, and his card is worth a ton of money, and he has an autograph on there, so they would grade the four subgrades on the grading card, you know, on the, on the slab, and when you get it, you're going to get a big, thick plastic slab that these cards are going to be in, and they give you a grade from 1 through 10. For the most part, if it's a newer card, the production value is much better. So you should be able to stay in the range of 9 to 9.5. Very rarely do you get a 10. So if you were to get a pristine, they call that a pristine 10, that is worth a lot more than a PSA 10 because Beckett grades harder for newer cards. So, for the most part, a lot of people get 9.5s to 9s on all four of those categories, 
what you're looking for is a 9.5 for the card. You want an autograph. Um, they grade the autograph one to 10. Typically it's a 10, very rarely. And you could see on the autograph, I actually recently got an eight because I'm a nincompoop. Excuse my language. And you can see if it's if it looks a fugazi as the Italians say, it doesn't look right. Not that it's fake, but if it just looks stupid, if it doesn't look right, if it's not clean and crisp and there's little gaps to it, or it just looks odd. To, you know, he's signing hundreds of cards, so he gets tired after a while. Then, then you'll get a lower card, a grade. But for the most part, you're looking for 9.5. Um, which is the grade on the card and that would be accumulation of all four grades and then the autograph has a separate one Typically, it's a 10, you know every once in a while a 9 or an 8, but I, I would say most of the time it's a 10 You also have Beckett raw cards where the, you just say all right, just it, it, I just want you to it's a called a Beckett raw card review and it's cheaper, that's why people do it, and they just assign one number. You don't get as cool of a slab, it just gets like a sticker, a yellow sticker on top of it. And, um, but you save money. And the price difference in how much you can resell it for, there is a difference, but it's not crazy. You know, it's not a crazy amount. So that may be an avenue that you wanna do if you wanna save money as well. So you have those grading services. SGC is just like uh, PSA. They actually have, um, they go through like one through 100 and then they give you a one to 10 score. So they'll give it like a 96 and then they'll say nine on it or 86 and that's an eight. 70, you yeah, get the, it's the front number, you got it. So that's SGC. They grade a little bit tougher on vintage cards. And I don't know if they get, I don't know about the pricing. Um, if you get better price on PSA or not. I think it just depends on the card and depends on who you talk to. So, so far we have supplies. So far we understand the cards now. It's not about, it's not all about being a raw, raw dog. It, it is about grading. Now, people do sell raw versions of cards, not graded versions of cards. And they're typically newer cards that they do that with. And they will go for a lower price. So what is some, what some people do is they try to be slick. They try to buy these cards on Beckett and try to get them graded, try to get that high grade and then they flip it. That's one way to flip cards, which is semi-difficult because a lot of the raw cards that people are selling on eBay, they know probably won't get a high grade or the highest grade. And some people do. Some people are just trying to get rid of them. They don't like the card. That's not their guy that they follow or whatever the case may be. So just be wary of that. So now, we went over those two things. You're like, Dave, I just want to buy some damn cards. I don't know what you're talking about nonsense to me. So, there's two avenues that you can go by. You can go vintage, like I said, where you're collecting the cards that you know that you remember. So maybe you're a 70s kid, an 80s kid. If you're going that route, I would say go with graded cards, especially for investments. Um... I'm not gonna go into each specific year what you should and shouldn't invest in because that's, A, I don't have that knowledge, and B, I don't think anyone has that encyclopedia of knowledge and would be able to spew it within, you know, half hour, 40 minutes. What I suggest is collect the plays that you like, um, collect the teams that you like starting off, and then branch out. If you're not following baseball, start following baseball. Um, start reading articles about baseball. Start watching YouTube videos. Um, start immersing yourself in baseball card culture. They also have Facebook groups. 
um, that you guys can win. I have a Facebook group. You can, you know, go there, SV8 Baseball Card Collectors. Um, I, in my group, it's not really about buying and selling cards. It's about um, learning, transferring knowledge, um, asking questions, asking what you think are stupid questions. Because if you go in a lot of these other Facebook groups, you know, you're going to get made fun of. You got a lot of kids in there as well. Um, and they're going, it, it, it's, you just want a damn answer. You don't want negativity. You're just like, man, I just, I, I don't understand this. I don't know what this is. I'm new. I don't need a thousand people saying how stupid I am, you know? And so that's where my Facebook group can come in. But there's other great Facebook groups and they are more for buying and selling cards. Um, but if you're going the vintage route, there's things that you need to do. One, you need to check eBay solds. Don't look at what people are selling it for. Look at what these cards have gone for. And I would suggest only buying through auctions. Very rarely are you going to find a card um, for buy it now on eBay. That is a good deal. They may have make an offer. And so then you do make an offer at what you know the sold comps are at. Um, some people just buy them, and I think that's a mistake, and that's why people price them high, because some people just want a card and that's it. I want it, I want it, I want it. So, there's that. Now, you may hear my map, because I'm trying to get to my job, and... Sorry, I'm gonna have to. Oh, gotta tell me to stay on here. Oh, silly map. Okay. So, sorry about that. You told me to go one way, and then all of a sudden, when I finally get to the exit, of course, it tells me to go a different way. Stupid ways. Alright, so where was I? Alright, so vintage cards, you need to be buying graded cards. Yes, you can buy raw cards, and you can get them much cheaper than you used to be able to. Because everyone wants these cards graded. And for investment purposes, you want to get them graded as well. If you're collecting and you just want the cards, the condition are not as big of a concern, then raw card it. You can buy them on eBay. You can buy sets. There's auction houses where you can buy sets or large bulks of, of cards, and you can go to card shows and be able to buy them at, at a decent price, better than what we did when we were growing up. I think anyway. Um, I might be wrong about that, but the cost is much cheaper. You can even get a big time player for much cheaper because the card's all hacked up or, or whatever. Now. You have eBay souls that now you need to check out for. There's also a consignment company called PWCC. Now, what they do is people may not want to sell their cards on eBay, or they don't want to deal with the, this all these issues, so they just give it to this company, PWCC, and they take care of the rest. They have a big user base, a big email list, so when they um, sell your cards, a lot more people who collect baseball cards will know about it and then they will direct them to eBay um, they have been there's some sketchiness with PWCC recently with regards to the car, cards that they sell but um, that I'm just telling you they're pretty big a lot I I've bought a ton of cards from them um, but recently the more higher ticket cards it seems like there's some tomfoolery afoot but that's not what this is about. Um, so they have a, in, a market research where they could check the eBay solds all the way back from 2004, which is a huge tool for investment. Um, when you check eBay solds, you can only check the past three months and that's it, you're done. So if anything sold after that or before that, tough luck. You're not going to be able to find it. An app that I think, that I suggest you guys get 
is completely. I believe it's a dollar or two ninety nine, something like that. And I think I think it's just you buy it and that's it, and you call it a day. And that will tell you. A lot of people when they do buy it now or they make an offer and people agree to it, they don't show that price on eBay. On that app completely, they show you the price. So it's a pretty good tool to use um, for free. Uh, not for free. <laughs> Duh. For a very small amount of money. And uh, it's something I use. I also sell other stuff on eBay. I use electronics, whatever I find at garage sales, things like that. So it helps me see all the sold prices and also the sell through rate which is how fast a car sells. Not how, uh, how fast they do have a duration, but also if you have 100 listings and only five people sold stuff, they'll show you that if it uh, has a low sell-through rate, it may not be the card that you wanna buy if you're looking to flip the card. If it has a high sell-through rate, then you'll see that people like the card and is interested about, the, you know, they want the card. So now it's something for you to take a look at when you're at a card show, Facebook group, or, or on eBay. So that's one place to look. Um, I tend to tell people to go with the teams that they like because you're going to be more invested into it starting out. And you'll want to know, you know, as a Yankee fan, it's difficult because those cards tend to go for a lot more money because there's a lot of Yankee fans. Um, only true Yankee fans are from New York, by the way. So if you're outside of New York and you're a Yankee fan, go, you need to cheer for the team that's close by, even though if they suck. Should have been born in that state. Sucks to be you. <laughs> um, so, you got all your stuff. Now you go to PWC C Marketplace, and you can see the value of a card. Has the card been going up? Has it been going down? They even tell you auction prices and best offer prices, and you will typically see which cards sell better. Does it sell better in an auction? Should you wait for an auction to buy this card? Should you just buy it now because it's pretty much the same price? <clears throat> what should you do? You also can go to PSA card, and there I would sign up <coughs> and you will be able to see auction prices for cards so you sign up for PSA card which is a grading card you can put your graded cards in there and they will keep track of it you can put where you bought it how much money what date and it'll keep track you know keep track of it you know, I definitely suggest you keep in an Excel spreadsheet of all the cards that you buy. Um, it'll be much easier for you to search, to figure out how much you bought it for. It's just, it will be easier, trust me. Because you don't want to be looking at a card and you're trying to sell it and you have no idea how much you bought it for, if you're even making a profit or not. Just trust me on that. Because a lot of times, a lot of times you forget even the cards that you buy. So you don't even know what you have. So it'll be a good thing to look at if you're not at home and you don't want to go and sprint and start filling through all the cards that you have. So if you have something written down, then you can just search it more easily. So PSA card, you sign up, you can put your stuff in there, but they also, they also give you the population rate. How many cards have been graded PSA 10, PSA 9 of a particular card? Um, auction prices. How much, ha how much has it sold? And it'll break it down by grade for you. And it'll give you a couple of years. It's pretty accurate for the last like three or four years, I would say. Um, so you have three avenues to get a good idea of what price a card goes for. SGC also has a pop report and they'll tell you how many I don't remember if it has auction prices. I don't think it does. So I think it just has the population of how many, you know, tens, nines, eights. Beckett, I believe, has a pop report as well. I don't think they have an auction. You should sign up for them as well. Um, 
those are so those are the areas where you can look for pricing. You can get a good understanding of what something costs. Has it gone up and down the past five, ten years? You can be able to do that based off of eBay um, and PSA card. And so that will give you a good idea of pricing, investment, collecting, the whole nine yards. So you have a good idea for, about that. So now, moving on to more recent cards. Now you're going to be looking towards Beckett cards or raw cards. Now there's only two makers. You have Topps, who owns Bauman, and you have Panini, who owns Dunruss and Leaf. Or they're all together, something like that. Now, Panini, Dunruss, Leaf, they cannot have the logo on it. So those cards, their resale value is cheaper. Doesn't always mean the box of cards are cheaper, their resale value is cheaper. They tend to offer more autographs. The cards tend to be thicker and made a little bit better than Topps, but Topps does have cards that are thicker and nicer, but they just cost more money. Topps has a huge array of cards. They may have 15 to 20 different sets. I don't know them all on the top of my head, but there's a ton, a ton. And so, one of the places that you can go is a website called cardboardconnection.com. Going there, you'll see all the different releases of cards. And from there... In a quarter of a mile, oh exit right. Hey, you just told me to change again. These guys are bastards. In 0 0.1 oh, miles, right. exit right. Do I still have to get off the... No, now it's telling me... You know what, this, this ways. So, cardboardconnection.com, it will give you a checklist of all the cards that they have, all the autographs that it has. It won't tell you the print run, they're a little, um, they don't tell you that, but it's a lot, 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 lot less than back in the day. And so, Topps and Bauman are the only ones that have the Major League Baseball logo on them. Now, if you are trying to collect if you're going for investments, the big investments are going to be Bauman. Bauman Chrome, and you're looking for first card. And it literally will say for a player. So, for example, the big player now is Vladimir Guerrero. He just came up. He's starting to heat up now. His rookie card is from 2016. And I should say, I, I don't mean rookie card. His first Bauman card is from 2016. His Bauman Chrome non auto graded at a PSA 10 goes for 100 bucks, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. I haven't checked recently, which is a lot of money for a base card because there's a ton out there. Now you have autographs. So with those autographs, you have a basic autograph and it's on their card, on his card. And I don't know the amount of cards but I'm going to throw a number out there let's just say there's 500 or 1,000 I don't know that they don't give that number out but there's there's a there's a lot out there then they break it down into refractors and colors and each color represents the amount of cards that have been signed so the next one you'll have is a refractor a lot of times you have refractor cards that are autographed. Sometimes not. Sometimes they go straight to, uh, it'll have a slash to it, and it'll be $4.99. And there'll be no card, no color, they'll just say $4.99, and it has his autograph. Then you have purple. And purple is 250 cards have been signed. Then you go down to blue, which I think is 150. Then you have green, which is 99 now they've come out with a sparkle or black and that's usually in between the 50 and the 99 usually it's 77 for some reason sometimes it's 75 i've seen i think i've seen i don't know but that's the number range there the sparkle black one then you have the gold which is 50. you have orange which is out of 25. then you have red which is out of five 
and then you have a one of one. And you be guessed it, there's only one card of them. And so that one card is worth a ton of money for top prospects. Thousands of dollars. Way more money than any vintage card. You may, I mean, outside of Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays rookie cards, but for example, Otani, Shohei Otani, who is a two-way player from the Angels, he pitched and he hit. His Super Refractor, I believe, went for half a million dollars. So you could either have a Mickey Mantle rookie card in a probably PSA 7 or 8, or this one-of-one one refractor of Mr. Otani. I believe it was 500, I don't know if it was 500 or 250. Yeah, I know that's a big difference, but it's still hundreds of thousands of dollars for a guy who played one year and did very well. So, as you can see, typically the prices go are higher as the amount of cards. So like the reds out of five will be a ton of money. The orange will be a lot of money. Gold, you know, is less than the orange. And as you go up, for some reason, the blues are more money than the greens. Most people like the blues better than the greens. I don't know why, but I've noticed that. So if you see that price discrepancy, that's just, I, I don't know why. I have no idea. I can't figure it out. It's not always the case. Large majority of the time it is. Large majority of the time it is. So, you now have this knowledge. You understand the different gradings, the autographs. You also have these colors, non-autos. And it goes through the same thing. It's the same gamut, but just non-auto. Now with Bauman, you have Bauman Chrome, and then you have the Paper Bauman. And that's just like a regular baseball card. The Bauman, they're called Bauman Paper. And the Bauman Chrome is very shiny. It's got some crap on it. You can actually wax it. People do wax it to clean it. And um, it's just much nicer. So the paper does not go for nearly as much as the chrome. And actually the paper, they have that same color gamut as well. Um, I don't know if they have sparkles, but they do have all the colors. And they are not worth nearly as much as the chrome. And the chrome non-autos are not worth as much as the autographs. Those are what people collect. And when they go, I want to collect prospects, that's what they're talking about. Bauman. Bauman Chrome, Bauman Chrome Autos, and they're looking for a first card. Now, when a guy goes up and he finally makes it to the majors, Bauman Chrome will create a rookie card for them. So, a rookie card used to be, in our heads, that's the first card that was made for them. That's not the case now. Um, for Bauman, at least. Bauman, you have a first card in 2016. You're probably going to see a rookie card from Vladimir Guerrero and I'll say the RC this year in the 2019 Bauman Chrome and usually they go later in the year they're released and you can check when they're being released you go to Cardboard Connection and they'll give you a timeline as to when cards are being released and you'll be able to click on the different types of cards you can if you want to collect baseball or maybe you also like football or basketball you can modify it by that and so you'll know all right this month these type of cards come out let me see which cards i like i don't like um should i buy a hobby box all right so now i, I jumped ahead so now when we're talking about prospects you're talking about bauman there's also another thing called bauman prospects bauman draft you'll see and that comes at the end of the year and that's where a lot of the first cards come out and basically what it is is guys that were drafted that year they made baseball cards of um, and so you'll get most of the first rounders you'll get some other guys in there and these cards go for a ton of money because people are trying to collect the cards and hoping three years down the line these guys become big and it's a cheap it's a cheaper way to do it 
because for, for the most part, when you buy them now and you buy them in a box, they're going to come in really good condition. It's not like back in the day, bad production, being stored for 30 years, they're going to get dinged up. So that's what a lot of people do. They'll buy a case of these cards, open them up, keep all the autos, because you get three autos per box. They go for 150 to 175 per box. And sometimes these boxes go crazy high, depending on who's in it. So it may go two years down the line, and now you have Vladimir Guerrero in that box, and it's it's a hot box, as the kids used to say in high school. And um, it'll cost three, four hundred dollars for that box. So you may want to hold off, and maybe you try to resell some boxes. I suggest open up boxes, keep all the autos, keep all the um, colored cards, and just wait, because you have no idea who's going to be good or who's going to be bad. You think you do, but you don't. Maybe some guy all of a sudden figures it out, he grows four inches, five inches, just gets bigger, hits the weights, his eyes get better, he's able to see the ball better, I don't know. But you never know what cards are worth. Maybe you... Maybe you try to sell right away because some cards go for crazy amounts of money during the first couple of weeks and you try to capitalize on that. But after that, if a card is worth five bucks or you can sell it for five or ten bucks, hold on to it. What's five, ten bucks to you? You already spent the money on the box. You're not going to be able, you probably won't be able to recoup you, your money unless you hit a really big card. Hold on to it, wait and see and you keep doing that year after year, you're gonna be able to have, so now this year, I, I bought a bunch of 2018 prospects. So now when this comes around, maybe some of them did well, maybe them did not. Well, the ones that did well, maybe I sell some of their cards, or maybe I wait another year. But you'll have, if you keep buying them every year, you'll have a fresh stock of cards to sell. And then you can sell them and to buy newer cards. And that's one way to go about doing prospects. Or you can look at their stats. There's a place you can go to Fangraphs, and they'll give you a ton of statistical stats. Um, another guy to go to is Slab Stocks. They're really trying to change the way um, stats are being looked at with regards to card value. Um, they, I used to not like them as much because they would say, hey, we like this card, and then all of a sudden, they're selling that same as that card, which I didn't really like. So they still do that, but not as much. But they have the statistics, and you can see the prices of cards go up and down. And then they're telling you, hey, this is what we think are the key indicators of why a card goes up and down. When I'm looking at prospects, I tend to look at walk ratio, strikeout ratio, on-base percentage, home runs, and doubles. If they're a younger guy and they just started off, I look at doubles. If they hit a lot of doubles, that means if they start beefing up and get stronger as they get older, they're going to hit more home runs. If they get on base more, if they have a high walk rate, that means they have a good eye. If they have a low strikeout rate, they are very selective and they're smart. If all those things are high and they just smash and they hit a ton of home runs, people, I said it before, chicks and middle-aged men collecting baseball cards dig the long ball. And so... Those cards tend to go for a lot more money. Guys who hit a lot of home runs. So you can go to fan graphs, check some stats, um, compare it to the top prospects. You can check prospects by team, which is what I suggest. So you are invested in your team a little bit more. Um, and then you can compare it to the top 100 prospects. They might be in it, they might not be. Are their stats similar? Then you can check their cards, their card prices. Is it a good deal? Maybe you buy five or 10 of them for five bucks. I'm all stuffed up. So, just things to think about when you're trying to collect prospects. And um, so, that's one way, that's where most people go when investing in prospects. If you just want to collect cards, um, Topps has a ton of different cards. A ton. Um, and now you have hobby and retail. Retail is cards that you can buy through Target, through Walmart. Those are the two guys they sell through. 
and they come in blaster boxes and you pay 20 bucks and you get like seven packs and sometimes they'll come up with like a, a special pack that sells some nonsense and in there you can get autographs too not as prevalent though and there's no guarantee you buy a hobby box you get a guarantee so typically when you buy a hobby box let's just say you go with tops they have one where you get either an auto or a patch one or the other patches are not worth as much money as autos but you would go what a game used jersey is not worth it's not i thought it would be too but it's not and then you would need a different thicker card holder i'm going to go back to one second for the card holders they have on a website um i forget the name of it and it shows you the card thickness and you print it out you can measure you can put your card right up against it and measure the thickness and it'll tell you exactly which top loader to buy so your card fits nicely um, I wish I said that earlier in the segment but I didn't but at least I'm bringing it to your attention now if you made it through this tirade this long long discussion so now I lost my train of thought. Oh no! Oh no! Tops. So, Tops Hobby, you can either buy an auto, you can get a hobby box where you either get an auto or a patch. If you buy a jumbo, you get one autograph automatically and then you get two patches. Um, other baseball cards, you just get straight up autographs. They say, hey, you're gonna get one auto. Uh, Bauman Best. Now, Bauman has Bauman, Bauman Chrome. Bauman Best and Bauman Prospects. Typically in all of those, you get a guaranteed one autograph. Bauman's Best, you get three autographs um, for 120 bucks for the box. Beautiful cards, not pricey much. Tops has a ton. I, I can't even try to figure it. You got Tops, Tops Museum, Tops Fire, uh, Tops Chrome. Um, yeah, Gypsy Queen. You got what's the ones that just came out? Uh, tier one cards. You have Top Series Two, Top Series Update. Um, I'm missing a ton. I'm missing a ton because I'm blanking out right now. Um, I just rattled off like eight or nine, and I'm missing the biggest ones. Tops Heritage, um, where they designed the cards from back in the day with the newer guys. Um, and then Topps Heritage has an, uh, an update version of their cards. How they call them high series. Um, so there is 15 to 20 different sets that Topps makes. Ranging from $80 for a box to upwards to 1000 And in that 1000 you may get six cards and they're all, auto they're all autographs. I think there may be one, I forgot, that's like $10,000. Or hundred thousand dollars. I forget. You get all these crazy cards, all these autographs, and crazy stuff like that. So there's a ton of cards. I can't tell you which one is good or not. Um, that I will make in a separate uh, video or podcast because there's so many cards. Um, typically, what you could do is you have tops. Tops update tend to ha be a little bit more money because that's where the rookie cards are of guys that just came up and they're doing really well, like Juan Soto last year, um, Batani, um, Clayton Torres. In half a mile, keep left. Oh, sorry, guys. In a quarter of a mile, keep right left. Now, so um, I get to my job because there's so much traffic in New York that I have to go different routes each time, which makes it a lot of fun. Doesn't, doesn't it make it a lot of fun? So, right now we have... Keep left. All right. Let me just see here. Five, uh, 5A. All right. I know what we're doing. Okay. So, card holders. We have stuff to put the stuff in. We know about grading. We know about vintage. Where to go to get pricing. The newer cards, we know that we need to collect pro for prospects, we need to collect Bauman and Bauman first. Um, we know 
Cardboard Connection is the place to go if you want to figure out cards, um, the different sets of cards that are coming out. And they'll even give you pictures of the cards as well, so you'll be able to select them. Um, then you can also check the previous years, because they change, but not a crazy amount. And so you can take a look and get an idea of what they go for, the sales on them, the resale value. Um, and, and that's pretty much it, guys. You can go if you want to start off and um, start buying cards. I would say go to your local card shop. They actually tend to be cheaper on boxes because not many people go to local card shops. Usually they just buy it on eBay because they like it being shipped to them. And so you can probably save yourself 20, 30 bucks because they don't update their prices sometimes. Sometimes they're knuckleheads. Sometimes you have guys that are really on the ball. It just all depends. Um, it really does. So, I'm trying to think of anything else when you're starting out. Ah, duh. Now, you want to learn more stuff. YouTube. If you want to see, um, there are people that make YouTube videos and just say you want to buy 2019 Topps Heritage. There's people that open boxes of cards and you'll see what they look like, what cards to look for. And as they're talking, they'll even tell you, hey, I know this card went for a lot of money or that card went for a lot of money. Um, so you're able to see before you buy what they look like, how many cards come in a pack, all that good stuff. Excuse me, sorry. I'm just getting stuffed up from the air conditioner in my car because I'm so not used to it. Um, now, YouTube videos, Facebook groups, very important. A lot of sales go through Facebook groups. Um, I would check and see what people are buying and selling. Just watch and listen. Well, not listen, reading. Because they will tell you what people are buying. They will tell you what people are more interested in if you're looking to flip, if you're looking to make money. Um, it's very important to know what people want. You could buy a bunch of cars and nobody wants them. Yeah, you might have gotten a great deal, but nobody cares about them. So it's just important to know you need to buy and sell what people want, what people are looking for. Um, blow out uh, forums. PSA card has forums. A lot of people buy and sell cards, vintage cards through there. Um, a lot of people go, they have their own threads and they'll go, all right, we're just buying and selling 1955 tops on this thread. And all the people posting on that thread in that, you know, in that website, the PSA cards, if those forums, they create threads. This is something that you should somewhat know if you're an older guy, but if not, they have forums and then on the forum on PSA card forums they have message boards and they have threads and those are just topics so they have hundreds of different topics and things and a lot of them go all right this is the 1961 tops collecting thread and people will show off their cards people go look I'm trying to find this car I'm trying to sell these cards and you can you want to have a good reputation and you can you want to engage and you want to um that's a place where you can get good deals because people go hey i know you're collecting uh, we're collecting the same thing you've been talking a lot on these things let's let's make a trade let's make a deal you can also do that on psa cards people register their sets on psa cards when you look at people's registries you'll see what percentage of cards uh, of the sets are completed and you can see what they're missing maybe you buy that card and you try to sell it to them for more money you have to get a good deal obviously but that's one way to do it and you'll see there's a little envelope right next to their name that means you can email them you email them and say hey I got a bunch of cards do you want to buy do you want to sell are you selling cards it's a great way to buy cards from other people as well um, blow out cards forums is another place very similar to PSA cards it's the same thing they have threads where people are buying and selling cards so you have all those different avenues 
And what you want to do is you want to build trust within the industry. You don't want to be a guy. You want to be very transparent. If you start buying and selling cards and these cards, you dropped it on the floor and there's a nick on it. There's a nick on the corner or whatever case may be. You want to tell people and be upfront about it. You might not make as much money, but who cares? Because if your reputation is tarnished or bad, you're going to be put on a list. There are lists of scammers and or people who just uh, you know make bad deals and people not to trust. So you don't want to be on that list. You want people to go, hey man, no, definitely do a deal with this guy. You don't want any problems. And it's very important that you have a good reputation. Somewhat similar to why I'm doing these things is, um, A, I enjoy it and I like to see people doing well. Um, I know I had a lot of those bad tendencies when I started reselling, you know, a bunch of years ago, got a long time ago. And um, I'd rather not, I'd rather be upfront. I'd rather tell people what the real deal is. Um, I'd rather give. And, and customer service is very important. You hear, you hear me a lot in podcasts if this is the first time listening. I'm a big customer service guy. So if someone buys a card from me, on eBay, I'm gonna throw a bunch of other commons in there of that team if I think that's what they are. I'll try to find out, well, if they're from Florida, they might like the Marlins, they might like Tampa Bay. I'll try to figure it out. If they're buying a Tampa Bay Rays card, they would probably like the Tampa Bay Rays. So, unless it's a Mickey Mantle, I don't have any Mickey Mantles, but I'm not gonna sell them a bunch of Mickey Mantles, but you get the idea. What is it to give 10, common cards of Tampa Bay or even a nice card a better card it's nothing you're keeping them in your box you probably don't even collect this team give it to someone else they're not expecting it they're like wow that's great this guy gave me some extra cards really nice I'm going to do more deals with him and you probably get more sales out of it too um, I would also suggest if you're really getting serious about this and you really want to do this as, as an investment Create a Facebook page. Have some place for people to go where you could talk and you go, hey, these are all my cards that I have for sale. Maybe even create a website. Um, you don't need to do this stuff. Um, I'm more of a forward thinker. I And this is stuff that I haven't even done yet. I should. I should already have a website um, and I don't and I'm annoyed at myself about it. So, But it's building your own brand and so you can get better deals so you can make good trades and you can have fun. You can build relationships. It's, it's fun. You want to talk about baseball. You want to talk about baseball cards. You build, you know, you're building a neighborhood of people who like cards, basically. An online neighborhood. So that's what you want to do. If you want to jump right in, you can go to Walmart. You can go to Target. Go to your local card shop. And you can buy a couple of packs or you can buy a box of cards. Go right. Dive right in. Um, but just check the eBay solds for the most part. That's what you should be doing. If you're not sure, just go to eBay, put it, the app on your phone and just check the solds. You'll be able to get a good idea of what's going on there and have a good gauge of if they're overpriced or not and haggle. The worst that someone could say is no. So if they want 150 bucks, go look, man, you need to do better than that. I'll give you 125. And then they'll just go, no. And then you go, okay. And then you try to get it for a lower price. That's what I do. Um, other things, Facebook Marketplace. Most of the cards are overpriced. But it gives you the opportunity to search the solds. And then make a offer. And sometimes they're just good deals. I just bought 84 Tops uh, rack box for 20-something bucks. They came out to 25 something like that, or less than that, $22 per box. It's a good deal. There was 50 other deals that I looked at, you know, posts that were garbage deals, but, you know, there was some that were, were good. So, just be wary. There's deals to be made everywhere. And if you can, try to bundle so if you're looking for a deal and they're selling a bunch of cards, go, how much is it for all of them? Because then they'll drop their price. Because now they can get rid of everything. 
and just make sure be cognizant of how much you're spending and what the deals are but that's the way I typically am if I see a good deal on one card and they have other cards that I want but not as badly and they want to get rid of everything just buy the whole thing and undercut them um, you have places like offer up where you can buy stuff um, that's more for used electronics and things like that but they do sell baseball cards or in, and memorabilia let go offer up facebook marketplace good tactic to do is if it's been on there for six months low give them a low ball offer they may bite they might just say, look i'm just trying to get rid of this this stuff i don't want it in my house um and that's with anything even not baseball cards um the internet has opened up a lot of things instagram set yourself up on instagram mine is sva bb collectors go on instagram tons of people are buying and selling on there create and start following people that are into baseball cards um liking this stuff commenting on things posting pictures of your baseball cards it's just another place to build a community so right now back in our day we had local card shop your friends that was it and card shows that was it you had three places to get cards in the candy shop when you could buy a, they had uh, wax boxes now you have eBay you have Facebook groups you have Facebook marketplace let go offer up forums blowout forums PSA card forums Instagram Twitter everything you have a ton of places to get rid of these cards to buy cards to build a community so there's no reason for you not to be able to get good deals buy cards and have fun that's the most important thing um, enjoy it um, I try to I keep it away from my wife because she's a Debbie Downer because she thinks I am a baby I'm a kid and um, <clears throat> I just enjoy it it's fun I like it a lot I like it a lot so I think I've rambled on enough this is the longest podcast that I have done but this is a good foundation for you starting off collecting and uh, guys SVA baseball card collectors on Facebook SVA BB collectors on Instagram I'm also on Twitter but I'm more on Instagram and my Facebook group um, I'm also doing YouTube videos SVA baseball card collectors on YouTube and um, I enjoyed this I hope you guys got a lot of information and value out of this my mantra buy some cards and go broke people later